in, in very small details and in very big ways is, is brings us to our next, um, our next <laughs> guest, who's really not so much of a guest. Um, <laughs> and so it's really a tremendous pleasure to have with us Rachel Gemara, um, from, from originally from Toronto, who now lives in Yerushalayim. Um, many of you I know have been following Rachel over the past um, three months since the outbreak of COVID-19. And it's a very, I, personally I find it to be, it's a very strange crisis for many of us because it's a crisis where we all just, we're all hunkered in our homes and we don't actually see with our own eyes what's going on. And it kind of, we're only, we're only living through this crisis in, in a certain sense of, we're learning vicariously through the media, through videos that we see, um, through speaking to family members, and it could be that we're affected personally, but it's very hard to really understand uh, on, a, on a deeper level, on an experiential level, really what's going on. And many of us have been following Rachel Gamara's posts on social media, her posts on um, um, her posts on the the internet. Thank you. My my son believes I should be wearing a white keeper on uh, on Yom Yerushalayim. So I appreciate that, Nadav. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, and to be able to Rachel has really opened up our eyes in a personal way to how this crisis is being dealt with by individuals who have really stepped up. And we thank her for stepping up and really saving so many people and also sharing that with us in a passionate, personable, and meaningful way. And so uh, thank you very, very much, Rachel, for, for joining us. Thank you. Um, so, um, well, let's, I, we think, uh, and everyone's been, many of us have been following you, um, also in the Israeli media, and you just had an article on the front page of the National Post um, I think it was yesterday or the day before, correct? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so in the Canadian media as well, um, and, and as I said, you're really making this very strong personal connection to, to what's happening and how people are dealing with it. But I want to start from the beginning. Um, you grew up in, um, like many of the people here in Toronto, um, you went to Opana, um, and then afterwards, right after Opana, you decided to make your way back to Israel. And I just want to know what, what uh, motivated you to make that jump? And furthermore, what motivated you to, to take that jump while in Israel and to decide to become a nurse? And, and not just a nurse, but even before Corona, you've always been in some of the most intense machlakot and the most difficult places within the, your nursing career. So first, the jump to Aliyah and then the jump into a medical career. Um, yeah, I feel like growing up in Toronto and going to Pana, Pana Akiva, um, for sure, I knew that I was going to end up in Israel 100% at, um, you know, as soon as I could. And right when I finished high school, I came to Israel, um, did a year of Jewish learning and then uh, started nursing school right after that. Um, but yeah, I think Toronto is a very Zionistic kind of community and there there's always kind of that push that Israel is our home and that's where we're that's our homeland and that's where we're meant to be and I certainly uh, felt that way then and I definitely feel that way now that I'm here and um, what was the second question um, why did you decide once you made Aliyah to jump into a, a, an intense profession such as nursing and and I know that even before corona you've you've always been in some of the most difficult um, wards in Shari Tzedek, and you've really put yourself in the middle of things. And uh, right. so what motivated you to do that? Uh, I guess I was, I mean, I wanted to be a nurse since I was very young. Um, and I definitely was looking for something that was gonna challenge me and something that I would find interesting um, and something that would really keep me motivated. So um, I've been an oncology nurse for 10 years now. And I, I mean, I'm gonna go back to that at some point, hopefully soon. Um, but the second that there was a chance to, you know, once they were looking for people to staff the Corona units, um, I wanted to be part of that as well. So I've been there for the last three months. Um, 
And how, how would you describe how Shari Tzedek and in general, the medical system across Israel, how did they react? Um, and do you think they reacted in, in, in the right way? Um, what was it like when things just got started off when COVID-19 hit? Um, I think they were, I think they did a really good job actually. Um, I think the rules and regulations started really early and um, I, I can tell you from working in the hospital, we were, we were very prepared. We were prepared for the worst. They told us that in May, we're going to have 300 ventilated patients. And obviously it wasn't even close to that, thank God. But um, we were really prepared for the worst. And we did, we, we had a lot of patients at, at the highest point. We had 110 um, at a time. So we definitely were at the full capacity, but we were always prepared. And if we ever needed to open us, and we, we had five units, if we had to open a sixth, seventh, eighth, they were, they had plans of how we were going to do that. Um, and yeah, I feel like they were, Shari Tedek for sure was really well prepared. And I never felt like we were overwhelmed or like the, the healthcare system was overwhelmed. So I would say definitely they did, Israel did a good job. Um, uh, as I said before, in general, when we're looking at things just on, on, on the news, we, we tend to just look at numbers and we see, oh, they thought there would be 300 people on ventilators, there were only 110. Oh, we thought there would be, um, you know, there'd be thousands of people that were sick, but it's lower, things are going down. And, and sometimes it kind of loses that personal um, connection. And so, uh, can you describe for us, um, did, it, when, when you, when, when, how did you, um, uh, when you, when, you, when all of these patients were coming in, was it also the sense of it's not as bad as we thought, or or was there were certain times when things got really really difficult? Right, um, it's kind of interesting when it started out. Um, the, like on my first shift, let's say we had we had eleven patients, and uh, it was really in the beginning, like early March, and uh, everybody was walking around nobody really needed oxygen they all just kind of needed to be isolated in a unit and just to be monitored so in case um all of a sudden they ha they started having difficulty breathing that they would be in a hospital setting and we can take care of them but they seemed you know they had very mild symptoms they were all doing pretty pretty well and uh you know they were receiving even not even not even like maximum kind of hospitalization type of care, which, which is good. I mean, most of the patients are mild. Um, and then slowly things started escalating and when the virus kind of spread to the rest of Jerusalem, um, it definitely, you know, it made a huge difference because there, then there was patients that uh, needed constant monitoring, constant care, uh, ventilations, intubations, you know, the whole, the whole deal, like really the hardest part of it. Um, but yeah, in the beginning, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily like that. Um, and what, what was, how would you describe the difference between your normal job as a nurse taking care of patients and sometimes very, very sick patients and, and specifically dealing with a, a pandemic like this? Is it, what, what would be the difference in terms of the care? in terms of what, what would be the difference in terms of how you cared for patients during this time versus how you care for patients just in a normal, um, what we call Shigla? Uh, um, sorry, it got, my internet got cut off. So if you could just repeat that one more time, sorry. Uh, no problem. Um, so the question was, how is, how was, how would you describe the difference between your normal job taking care of patients, even patients that are quite sick and specifically deal, taking care of patients who are um, in, uh, during a pandemic, during, during COVID-19. Right, um, yeah, it's actually, you know, I, I, I'm already so used to it, so I kind of even forgot, but um, it's the main difference is that they have this very highly transmissible virus and um, it, can, it gets passed on very easily. And because of that, we have to, be in full protection gear um and that makes a really big difference we're also not allowed to be there you know eight hours at a time because then the protective gear isn't as effective and we can get infected and then if i'm going home or going to the supermarket i could god forbid pass it on so you know that is a massive difference obviously 
And, you know, our, the entire way that we work is just based on, th on the fact that everything needs to be isolated. We need to be in full protective gear. We can only be in there two hours at a time. Then we have to go out, come back in. And, you know, it's a whole procedure. And um, it's definitely difficult. It, it took us a long time to kind of get used to working like that. Um, but it's, you know, it, it makes a, a huge difference because, you know, the protective gear, the, the patients can't really see us. They can't see who's who. They don't know who's a nurse, who's a doctor, who's a physiotherapist. Um, and also just, we have to make sure that we're really fully protected so that we don't, God forbid, um, contract the virus from them. And did you, um, did you experience during, over the past few months, um, anything that surprised you in terms of the humanity of the patient? Sometimes in the worst of crises, um, the best of people come out. Um, did you experience that as well um, while working in the COVID Absolutely. war? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it really is. I, I, when we went in, we didn't really know what to expect. We're, it's a new new disease. We don't know how it, how people are going to react and what the, the effects of it are going to be and what we were really going towards. Um, so we weren't really thinking in terms of what, what we didn't really know what to expect. We were really just taking it one day at a time. And um, I definitely didn't have any expectations of how the patients were going to react with each other. I didn't think that they were even going to, you know, in a regular unit, I don't necessarily, sometimes I'll have patients talk to each other, but usually it's quite rare that people are going into each other's rooms. You know, it's not like that kind of setting at all. But uh, I can tell you surprises and understatement. I was like blown away um, by what I was seeing. And that's really what inspired me to start writing about it. Cause that's, you know, I was so inspired by it. I wanted to share it with, with other people, but um, you know, they really, um, the people that were there in the unit, I mean, in the beginning, also in the middle, but definitely, in the beginning, they were really, they just wanted to take care of each other and they wanted to make sure that we, we stay safe and they didn't want to have us to go unnecessarily inside the unit if it was something that they were able to do. So, you know, one of the girls we taught, we taught her um, how to take blood pressure for, you know, for themselves. And then she just went ahead and she just did it for all the patients, even if it was something that we, you know, I would have gone in to do. And then they were constantly, you know, seeing what any, any, it was pretty much like the younger patients wanted to take help and take care of the older ones. And when they would come in, they would do their orientation and show them around any new patient that came in, um, help them eat, make sure, you know, there's always, and everyone's getting food, everyone's feeling well, nobody feels alone. I remember um, I had an 80 year old patient and he had hearing problem, like he had a you know hearing loss because of his age. And there was a, a patient in his 30s, and uh, he he would he called me. He's like, oh, I just want to let you know this patient. I'm not sure that he heard you on the loudspeaker. And I went to tell him, but just so you know, like he doesn't always hear you. So you know, I just if there's something a message you want to pass to him, tell me and I'll and I'll go to him. Like I have so many examples like that, but just they they really were they were like caretakers themselves and it's amazing because they were sick themselves and they were also dealing with a lot you know people that had to leave their families and people that had you know a woman that had a baby at home and she they all they wanted to do was just help each other out and it was it was incredible um it's it's really it's it, it those those stories bring make you speechless it's some, something like it's it's in the worst of times, we really find the best of people. Um, yeah. Is there any specific story, um, specific story of a specific patient that really touched you more than, that comes to mind more than any other? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the thing that definitely impacted me the most is um, really the, our first patient that passed away. And he was the first corona um, casualty in Israel, Arya Evan. Uh, so he passed away on a he was 88 years old but he was still you know he was with it he was he was relatively you know in good condition until the virus you know overtook that overtook him but um the patients he was there for five days before he passed away and the patients uh 
they really loved him. They told me that they felt like he was, you know, a grandfather to them. And they were really visiting him all the time. They gave him water. They helped him eat, covered him with a blanket. Um, obviously, I don't want it to sound like the medical staff, like, wasn't there or anything. But, like, we were definitely there. But for any moment that we weren't, um, you know, they, 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 didn't, they made sure that he's never by himself. Like, they really, really uh, went, went um, like, above and beyond just to make sure that he's comfortable and they knew how difficult it was for him that he's by himself. And it's, he, was, he, he was very scared because he knew what this, uh, you know, corona meant for someone with, in his situation. And uh, um, on Friday night, um, you know, they all got together to eat Friday Shabbat dinner together. And, you know, at, right when the, the meal did, they heard the monitor beep and they saw that he was taking his last breath and he was, it, you know, that it was really the end of his life. And we obviously were rushing to go in, but uh, I, I actually stayed back in, somebody needs to stay back in this, the thing, the, we call it the Hamal, like Khadam al Hamal, which is like the headquarters of where, you know, our control system of where we have the monitoring screens and where we kind of see what's going on inside when we're not inside. And um, I'm, I have a camera on him so I can see exactly what's going on. And they rushed in and they see that, you know, he's taking his last breath. And instinctively, they just realized right away and they were holding his hand and then they covered his eyes and they said Shema Yisrael with him. And um, it was, I was t crying right away because it, it really, really moved me. But, um, you know, my biggest fear was that he was going to, he, he might die alone because no none of us, his family can't be there. And what if the staff isn't there at that moment? And um, that was really the, the biggest fear for me and all, all of us, obviously. And uh, to know that, to see how the patients were really there in the most critical moments and they really comforted him in the last minutes of his life and such my Sir El, um, it was definitely, you know, something I'm going to remember for a long, long time. And as, as you said, um, one of the most difficult parts of, of this disease is the fact that people are really alone. Unlike when somebody comes into the hospital, you usually have your family members around you. you even, if, even if they have to be, um, they have to be isolated, very often it's in one room, we're able to see through the glass, and people are able to come visit. And, and this disease really created a situation where people were, were in the most difficult parts of their lives, and sometimes the end of their lives, were really by themselves. Um, yeah. And I think that what you're describing is, is, is that even though they were away from their families, the environment in Shari Tzedek was that they created, they really built their own family and a new family. And, uh, and, and were, everyone there was able to become a family for each other. And so that's like really amazing to, to hear. Um, and on that note, how do you think um, it was unique to be in a Jewish state dealing with this global pandemic um, as opposed to just being anywhere else in the world? What do you, what of your experience and the experience of how, of the patients would be different, the fact that we're in our Jewish state and not just anywhere else in the world? Um, I feel like the, you know, the, the Jewish values that, you know, all these patients shared, I mean, I'm working in the biggest Jerusalem hospital, so you could kind of imagine the population that you know we mostly had and um you could really see i know i was there for pesach as well but um these jewish you know the minion three times a day and the fact that they did shabbat meals together uh those things really kept them strong and really kept them going you know there were patients helping each other the older patients put on tefillin and you know that it's really what kept them strong and what really kept them going like they were in a way in a way it's not something that they were able to have if they were home if they were home or before they got sick because all the shuls were closed for weeks so this was really one of the only functioning um minion or only permissible minions and functioning minions in um in jerusalem in israel so i think that's a huge deal and you know even just hearing like them saying um, Kedusha, like I, I was like, why does this sound so weird? And then remembering that I've not heard that like in so so long. So the fact that you know there were people who were able to say Kaddish for their parents or for other people because no one else in Israel is able to do that right now. So I think that really definitely makes it special, and it's something I, you know, I, 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 
I hope that in I don't know, maybe in New York it's different, but I doubt that in the hospitals in Toronto, there's enough people to make a minion. But I think in my hospital at one point, they were able to make like seven, like seven minions because there's that many people. So, you know, it's, it's really amazing, but you really see how these Jewish traditions and Jewish values gives people so much hope and so much strength during these, these difficult times. And that's, um, ex that's definitely very unique. It's really, it's, it's an amazing, it's, it's really very, very special to hear. And, and even though it's true, um, I don't know if stories like this are coming out of other places in the world, um, but the Jewish values of, that we have a state and a medical system that's able to be built around those values is, is you don't realize how incredible it is until obviously the worst, the worst happens. And so to have people like you um, at the helm of, of such, of such, um, of machrakot, of, of such difficult situations is uh, something that we should be thankful for and really say to that to Hashem. You know, I, I never actually thought about it that way, that, that, that we have a state and that just means, okay, it's incredible. We have a place to live. We have a place to go to. We have a place to build. We have a military, but it really changes everything when you have not just a military and not just a state and not just politics, but a medical system and nurses and doctors and, and, and public health officials that look at these problems from, from a Jewish perspective and a perspective of Jewish values and to see how it expresses itself in, in what, you've, what you've described is truly incredible and a lot to give thanks for. Just as a, a closing remarks, is there any, anything that you would say you learned from this experience that really, that we can take home as a message um, hopefully to put this in the past and hopefully there will no, be no galim shniim and we can go back to regular life. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of takeaways for sure. And uh, I think the main one, I think, is just um, the fact that, you know, these patients, whenever they saw someone else who was struggling or someone that was, they were all in a difficult situation, it's just the fact that they were there. But some, it was obviously harder for them than others. And um, the fact that to see, you know, if the Jewish people, it's very much like if one person is, is struggling, we all feel it and we all want to reach out and do something about it um, the best we can. And obviously we saw, we see it all around the world for sure. But in Israel, you know, we keep hearing of stories about people going to helping, you know, getting groceries for their older neighbors or whatever it is. Um, and in the hospital, I mean, I got to see it on a daily basis and I feel very blessed for that experience. But, um, you know, it's definitely the biggest message is just, you know, uh, we're all in this together and we're all here for one another. And, you know, that's definitely our strength. And, you know, that's what unites us, that we all care about each other and want to pick each other up from these kind of difficult situations. So uh, that's definitely the main message. And um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess I, I also wanted to add another thing um, because maybe a lot of people don't know this, but um, like the patients that, um, it did get to a point where, you know, we were very lucky with Arya that there were other patients that were able to go, go and be next to him and say Shema Yisrael. But, um, you, you know, I didn't have, I, I didn't have this experience, but a lot of the nurses and doctors that I worked with did, was that when a patient passed away and there was no one else around, like no other patient that can go be next to them, then staff went in especially, and this is definitely, this I can definitely tell you maybe is only in Israel, but they went in to say vidui for them so that, you know, they're not going to have to die alone and that at least they'll have that last experience, which, um, you know, every time I had to witness that, it obviously brought me to tears. But um, just to go, just to add to that, like, you know, the Jewish traditions that kind of keep us stronger together. And, um, but definitely, you know, the strength of Am Yisrael is that we're, we're united and when one of us is struggling, we all feel it and we all want to help each other out and do something about it. Really, it's really very, very powerful and, and it's, it's very inspirational to know that, that, that Yom Yerushalayim were able to be thankful for, for the good and thank you for the difficult times, but the fact that we're able to um, to experience this in Yerushalayim and be able to have it in Yerushalayim is something that's 
very, very special. We thank you for everything that, that you've done in your selflessness. Um, we're going to take a couple of minutes. If, if anybody wants to ask a question um, to Rachel, do you mind if uh, we open it up? There's some... Uh, I'd be happy, for sure. Um, you can just, you can, you can send it in the text if you would like, um, and, uh, or you can ask it and I'll unmute you. All right. Thank you everyone for the messages. I'm just reading it now, but thank you, Yael, uh, Barbara, uh, Roberta, Esther. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Anyone want to ask something? Give people a moment to type. All right. I think, I think your parents uh, want to ask when they can come visit you. Uh, whenever they're, <laughs> if, whenever the flights are back, I'm sure that they're going to be the first to know. So, um, yeah. I hope um, it's soon. So Esther, uh, Esther Stern um, asked, uh, how many patients are still in the COVID ward currently? Uh, yeah, that is a good question. Um, yeah, we're really, you know, thank God and like we're, I think we're really reaching the end. Um, today we had eight and then we had three people go home. So now we have five. So it's the least it's ever been since, since we started. So yeah, it's definitely a good sign. Um, definitely if we think about the time that we were 110 and the nearly a thousand patients that, you know, more than a thousand patients that went through our doors, but now we're down to five. So it's, uh, it's definitely really good. We're really, really happy. Baruch Hashem. Is there anything specific you think that we can attribute um, the success that Israel has had compared to uh, what's happening around the world? Uh, I think, you know, I think the rules and regulations have really helped. Um, the social distancing, um, those kind of things definitely make a difference. So uh, in the times that, you know, this, this virus was incredibly infectious, that's when it was really, really important. And I think, I think people in Israel did, were pretty good about it from what I understand. So uh, yeah, I think that for sure helped. And you know, Israel started it pretty early, like earlier on than most people. So I think uh, that helped. And I, I think people here do, you know, Israel is that kind of place also. It's like, it's like uh, it's a stranger on the street. It's like, oh my God, you're not, why aren't you wearing a mask? Put on a mask right now. You're putting on, you know, everybody's kind of like, will tell you how it is and no one feels you know, like they feel like they're your family that they can just tell you what to do. And, uh, be, but it really it's because they also care about you and they want you, you know, they care about your safety and other people's safety. So uh, it's definitely that kind of um, culture. And also just, we just saw with um, Yehuda Glick, Glick that people are just approaching him on the street, like just talking to him, like, hey, whatever. So it's very much like that. And I, th I think that does help because people here do, do genuinely care about each other, even if it doesn't always sound like it. Um, another question is, meaning you just, as you, you were talking about the time when it was at its peak with 110, and obviously it was a very trying time for you. Um, what are your feelings about the country very, very quickly going back to normal and opening up? Um, what do you feel about that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's obviously really scary for me because I've seen the worst of the worst. So, you know, to think that, you know, there's going to be a second wave and then we're going to have to re repeat everything that we just went through um it's scary but uh you know i really do trust the experts on on this and misrata briot and um epidemiologists economists you know i'm i'm very glad that i don't have to make these decisions but i do trust the experts and i think that if they feel like you know and i do think they're doing it really in a very smart way that everything's done very gradually so it's everything open all at once. It's quite slow, but um, I think I, I, I mean, glad because I'm kind of re ready for it as well. But in the back of my mind, for sure, there's still that fear just because I'm, I'm in, I'm in that field. But uh, hopefully, you know, the experts know what they're doing, and I trust them, and I think you know most Israelis do. So amazing! Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, it was. Very, very powerful. I'm sure that everyone here was extremely inspired. Um, and I think that it was just, it was heartwarming, it was powerful, and it really shows the best of the Jewish people. And we really, really appreciate it. Probably the best part for me, other than hearing your stories, was 
watching your father's face and how proud he looks uh, as he's, he's, he's speak. And so, <laughs> I didn't know uh, my dad was there. Yeah, he's right. You should on the video. Hopefully, we'll have a recording of how your father looks at you while you while you spoke. So, Yishar Korach, and everyone really appreciates um, what you what you're doing and what you continue to do, and only batzlacha and only good things. Thank Hashem. you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, too. Okay. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, so, as we said before, um, that was very, very powerful. We're going from kind of taking a 180 degree turn um, between different aspects of, of Yerushalayim. And I think that um, for all of us, Yerushalayim means so much. And when you have a everything that we love so much, 